Hi, Crime Stoppers. Welcome back to my entire class. We are uh, going to open up today with with uh, uh, attendance. Kim, Kim, yeah. Kim is yeah. here. Okay. I am fortunate to have such a charming audience and thank you, Kim, so much for showing up. I've done one lecture without you and believe me, it is a weird feeling lecturing to literally nobody. Um, anyway, if you're watching this out there in uh, YouTube land, keep in mind you are allowed to attend as well. If you would like, just text me. I will send you the Zoom meeting number. Uh, and of course, today is a special one because of unforeseen circumstances. We are meeting on Monday as opposed to Tuesday, and we're meeting a little later than normal as well. Okay, <clears throat> I was just telling Kim about the radioactive fallout that occurred after the first nuclear uh, Chernobyl first nuclear meltdown, which was back in the 80s, uh, considered by many to be the worst nuclear disaster in history. Uh, a lot of people think that the worst nuclear history was Three Mile Island, which happened right here in the United States in New York. Um, it didn't get the news because it wasn't as dramatic. But um, as it turns out, one of the big problems after the fallout was radioactive strontium becoming uh, uh, in, uh, basically accumulating in the bones of people who live too close to the plant. If you look on the periodic chart, one of the alkali earth metals, and if you recall, alkali earth metals are family 2A. Uh, if you look down there, you're gonna find calcium. Calcium is used in bones to make bones hard. In fact, if you have um, weak bones, um, they will often prescribe calcium supplements. Well, right beneath calcium is strontium. And they're in the same family. They're right next to each other. When the, we talked about families before, I mentioned that Families all have very similar chemical and physical properties. Well, what happens and the reason strontium builds up in bones is because your body, they are so similar, calcium and strontium, your body cannot distinguish between them. So your body puts calcium in your bones to make your bones harder and when it gets strontium, and what happened was the fallout uh, caused strontium to spread throughout the grass and the plant life near Chernobyl. Uh, animals such as cows would eat that strontium and absorb it, and the cows would end up with strontium in their milk, which would be drunk by humans, and the strontium then becomes part of the bone, uh, causing real problems because it is radioactive. By the end of today, we're going to have a much deeper understanding of the periodic chart and why these things behave, why they're so similar in their reactivity. We're going to understand why uh, alkali metals are always plus one and halogens are always minus one. We're going to understand all of that. And um, it's, it's, it, and you're going to understand, and a lot of people don't really think about this. But why is it that the periodic chart, which, by the way, I, I, I actually have a tattoo of it. Um, I just recently, just a couple, just a week or two, a couple of weeks ago, I suppose, I got a tattoo that looks like this. Anybody who sees it knows it's the periodic chart. It's a very, I mean, it's very common. You see periodic charts pretty much all the time. Um, and it has a very distinctive shape. And we're going to understand why it has this very distinctive shape by the end of today. We're going to talk about electronic configuration. Last time we talked about quantum theory. 
Last time we went through and we saw Heisenberg's equation, we saw Schrodinger's equation. Um, I do not expect anyone to remember those equations. I certainly don't expect anyone to actually go through and solve them mathematically because that would that would take years of study of not just chemistry and physics, but mathematics as well. Um, but I gave them to you because I want you to understand that the rules we're going to go through today on electronic configuration are going to sound arbitrary. It's going to sound like someone sat in their office and made these up just to make life miserable for chemistry students. They're not arbitrary. They are based on mathematical solutions to Schrodinger's equation. Um, and I just want to remind you real quick of the wave function. Psi is when you pretty much square Psi, you get probability. And that will come up again. Uh, that will come up again. Uh, before the end of the lecture. But let's go ahead and let's talk about electronic configuration. Remember, we cannot, we cannot, we can't. I do not understand quantum theory. I do not understand electron behavior. I'm not allowed to. Heisenberg says I'm not allowed to know. <clears throat> Heisenberg is much smarter than I am, and all he said was, uh, so don't worry about understanding so much as, as uh, what quantum theory is doing. Don't, don't try and understand quantum theory itself. Today, we're just going to talk about the lessons of quantum theory. We're going to talk about what it teaches us re in regards to electronic configuration. And we can understand the rules. And the first rule, you ready for this? called the principal quantum number. Given the designation lowercase n, the first rule that Schrodinger's equation teaches us is that electrons live in shells. They live in shells. And this is the same thing that Bohr said. It basically, it, it basically it proved, well, we can't prove anything right. It basically supports the Bohr atom. The shells are numbered as integers starting with one. And here's something a little bit strange. I'm going to mention it now, and you're going to forget it by the end of the lecture. <coughs> every element has every shell. But they don't always use those shells. So when we talk about electronic configuration, we are talking about the ground state. Ground state electronic configuration. That is the lowest possible energy. As you walk around on your floor, as you're standing on your floor, you are on the ground state. You're at the lowest possible energy. Can you be higher? Yes. Watch a kid sometime. When they jump, they're in the excited state. They're above the ground. They have higher energy. And I'm suddenly in the middle of hiccups, and I hate the hiccups. And that makes me in the excited state. I'm not my ground state anymore. So yes, when we talk about electronic configuration, we're talking specifically about the ground state. Elements too can be in an excited state, usually for a very small period of time. So when we talk about the shells and all of that kind of stuff, um, we're talking about just the ground state. And I'm pointing out here, notice that these are real numbers. And they're real numbers because this is all the solution of a real mathematical equation. There are always, we designate letters. 
But even the letters actually are numbers from Schrodinger's equation, such as in the secondary quantum number. Designated with a lowercase l, the secondary quantum number. The secondary quantum number always starts at zero So instead of starting at one, it starts at zero and it goes up to the shell number minus one. Actually, I am going to, eh, we'll do it this way. So for shell number two, well, no, we'll start at shell number one. For the very first shell, L always starts at zero. But if it's shell number one, N minus one is zero, so we stop at zero. Okay? For shell number two, L also has a zero. But it also has a one. Since two minus one is one, the second shell has two of these subshells. These are called subshells. So n equals 2 has two subshells, the 0 subshell and the 1 subshell. Obviously, then, for n equals 3, now there are three subshells. Notice we go up by one subshell. Every time we increase the shells, the number of subshells within that shell increases by one. So let me ask you this, in the fourth subshell, I'm sorry, in the fourth shell, how many subshells will there be? Goes up by one every time. So if we had three subshells for the third shell, then the fourth shell will have four. four. I'm going to stop here, but I wanted to reach this because <clears throat> we designate letters for these subshells, all right? This comes from spectroscopy. Spectroscopers used to see this very fine structure inside their research and started assigning letters to them, and we basically kept those letters. So the fourth shell has what we call the S subshell. Notice that every shell has the S subshell. The S subshell is assigned to L equals zero. Every single shell has S equals zero. L equals zero. Every shell has L equals zero. First shell is the P subshell, all lowercase. The fourth shell is the D subshell. And the L equals three is the F subshell. <laughs> I think the dust at the drive in theater is kind of bothering my lungs these days. Anyway, it's always SPD, <clears throat> pardon my voice, puberty and all. SPDF after F. And we'll talk about why this is, it just becomes alphabetical. S P D F G H I J K L blah 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 blah. All right. Any questions so far? No, sir. Okay.
The third lesson. is the angular momentum quantum number. This is designated, uh, designated M with a subscript of a lowercase l, m sub l. And again, these are mathematical equations, right? Mathematical solutions. m sub l starts at negative l, goes up to negative two, negative one, zero. Then on the other side, L. They're all integers. They're all integers. So for example, here, L is zero, so it starts at negative zero. Negative zero is just zero. I'm going to remind us of the shell of the orb um, subshell number. This is the S subshell. Look at the P subshell. This is L equals one. M sub L starts at negative one. Negative L, so it starts negative one, zero, one. So notice there's a pattern to this. It's the easiest way, and you don't have to remember this, but there is a pattern which may help some people to, to understand it, may not. So when it's, whatever the L is, it starts on the negative value of that and goes up to the positive value. So notice, And we're going to stop there. Notice that there is only one value for M sub L in the S subshell. There are three in the P subshell. There are five in the F subshell, goes up by two every single time. So S has one, P has three, F, F has five. How many will D, I'm sorry, uh, D has five. How many will F have? Seven. Seven. And this is why it goes up by two every time, because mathematically, going from minus L to plus L. So it's always increasing by two. These are orbitals. These are called orbitals. All right. Orbitals are where electrons live. Orbitals are, I don't like definitions, but I'm going to give you one here. Orbitals are a region of space where you are most likely to find the electron. Orbitals are regions of space where you are most likely to find the electron. How do we know that? Well, let's go back to Schrodinger. Psi star psi. 
<clears throat> we can mathematically solve psi star psi. And I am not going to go into this because this is calculus. Let me try to be a little bit neat about it, or my mathematical friends would be angry with me. Basically, this equation is solving psi star psi in space. And they solve it for 0 0.9, or sometimes 0 0.95, or sometimes 0 0.99. This corresponds to 90% probability. And it doesn't matter what you solve it for. Could be 0 0.95, could be 0 0.99, doesn't matter. You could never solve it for infinity, for uh, 100. Because if you solve it for 100, short the, the probability equation will give you all of space. We don't want all of space. We understand the electron has to exist somewhere. We want to know where it's most likely to be found. We don't know that Tom Hanks is in Los Angeles today at this moment. We expect he's there most of the time. Electrons do the same thing. We solve it for 90% of the time or 95 or 99, whatever you want. These, gives a, these give us shapes, all right? This gives us the shapes of the orbitals. So the S orbital, for example, well, in fact, let's not even, well, yeah, let's do that. That's fine. My pen doesn't want to erase anyway. So the S orbital, looks kind of like a sphere. The S orbital looks like a sphere. Now there's an, well, let's not do that just yet, okay? With the nucleus right in the center. Now, <clears throat> solving Schrodinger's equation will tell us just how big that sphere is, but it looks like a sphere which is what we would anticipate. There's no real surprise there. It's a cloud. It's, it's some kind of spherical cloud. Actually, I want to take out the ends because no matter what your N is, the S orbital always looks like a sphere. They, they look like increasing spheres, but they always look like spheres. The P orbital. Oh, my eraser does not erase. The P orbital looks like a dumbbell. No, I'm not going to mention names. With two lobes. It's like a dumbbell. Kind of like this. Now, there are three P orbitals. As it turns out, the difference between them are directionality, which becomes important in organic chemistry. So sometimes they're oriented along the x-axis. Sometimes they're oriented along the y-axis. The third one is hard to draw because it's oriented along the z-axis. Um, so one of them is just going to look like a sphere from our perspective because we can't draw one behind, lobe behind the other. But notice there are two lobes. And this is an opportune time to remind you, and by the way, the nucleus right in the middle. One common question students have is, how is it if it's flowing in a figure eight that it doesn't collide with the nucleus? These shapes do not tell us, they do not tell us what the electron is doing. We're not allowed to know what the electron is doing. This is not how the electron moves. We don't know. Well, maybe it is how the electron moves. We don't know. We're not allowed to know. Ask Heisenberg. He'll tell you. Uh -huh. 
We don't know what it's doing in those lobes. It's just a little house. It's where they live. That's all it is. Um, and here's an example of what I mean when I say we cannot understand quantum behavior because there's something called a node. in the p orbital. A node is where an electron is forbidden. It's where the electron will never, never, never be because it's not allowed there. And this node in the p orbital is a plane. It's a plane that goes right through that nucleus, but it's a plane in all in, in both directions. Remember, a plane is two dimensional. So the node is infinitely large along both the x and the y axis for the z orbital, the one that's up and down. It's infinitely large. The electron is never, never, never allowed to be there. And yet, that electron, 50% of the time, roughly 59% 50 of the time is in the lower lobe, and roughly 50% of the time is in the upper lobe. No, upper lobe. How does it get from one to the other? I don't understand it. You don't understand it. Because you're not allowed to understand it because you're not an electron. It simply stops existing in one region of space and starts existing in the next. We don't understand the behavior of electrons. Critical to realize that. So don't even try. We, we don't know what it's doing. It's doing its own thing, man. Who are we? <clears throat> but like I say, and this does become important in some aspects of chemistry, a, an orbital, and these are each individual orbitals. These are what the orbitals look like. It's just a region of space near the nucleus where we are most likely to find the electron. That's all it is. Let's look at one more, and you'll see why we're going to stop here. The d orbitals. <clears throat> we went from one no one sphere to two. The d orbitals suddenly start having four lobes. Like this. Looks like a four leaf clover. But not one, but actually two nodal planes at right angles to each other. It runs right through the middle of these things. But, <clears throat> there's a big hairy but. There are five, if you recall, there are five D orbitals. There are only four of these orbitals with this particular four-leaf clover shape. The fifth one looks very strange indeed because it kind of looks like a P orbital. With a donut right in the middle. So it looks like a P orbital, which kind of looks like a dumbbell, but now we have this weird ring in the middle of it, just hanging out in space. Just It's just there. Why? We're not allowed to understand why. We know this shape is here because we solved Schrodinger's equation. We don't understand it. <clears throat> The F orbital doubles it again. So now there are most of them have eight lobes. 
Um, imagine taking two of these D orbitals and mashing them together so the lobes kind of go in and out and up and down and side to side and all over the place. Very hard to draw. We're not going to bother to try. But these orbitals all have very specific shapes and they all tell us the same thing. Maximum probability of finding the electron. It's just a region of space. If Tom Hanks has a vacation home in the Alps, a vacation home at Martha's Vineyard, and his main residence, all of a sudden there are three spaces where he could be found, most likely. And even then it's not 100%. Sorry, Tom, if you're watching this, respect you, man, much love. Anyway, <laughs> should do that. I pound on my chest where my heart has been broken and my heart attack many years ago. All right, before we move on, do you have any questions about orbitals, about shapes, any of that stuff? Shells and subshells, there's only one more rule. Any questions so far? Nope. All right. The last rule is very romantic. Spin quantum number M sub S. Probably one of the most poorly named concepts in the history of science. Unlike all of those other uh, rules that always expanded, notice they always expanded on the total number of shells. So n equals four gives us four subshells. Uh, four subshells gives us uh, five, I'm sorry, seven orbitals. It's all based on the shell number. The spin subshell only has one of two mathematical, again, mathematical solutions, minus one half or plus one half. These are not charges. They are not charges. Because the char of a charge of an electron, we know, is minus one. It's always, always, always minus one. But some moron went and called the minus one half spin down. And the plus one half spin up. The spin down is designated by a half arrow down. The spin up is designated with a half arrow up. Okay. Modern day science textbook authors do students a serious disservice because they will explain spin as you take your electron, which is a sphere, and you shove an axis through it, and it's either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, and boom! That is not what's happening. Maybe it is what's happening, but it is not what's happening because we're not allowed to know what the electron is doing. The electron is not even a sphere. Well, maybe it is a sphere. It's not a sphere. It's not a sphere. De Broglie, you may have heard the term de Broglie wavelength. De Broglie related the velocity and the size of a particle to a certain amount of wave-like properties. And the electron is as much wave as it is particle. So it's not a sphere. It's something else. It's something we cannot understand. So it's not a little particle on an axis doing clockwise or counterclockwise. We're not talking about planets. We don't know what spin is. We are not allowed to know 
what spin is. But the spin quantum number tells us that each orbital can hold up to two electrons if they are opposite spin. So each orbital can hold up to two electrons if they are opposite spin. That means that with one orbital, I'm sorry, the p orbital can hold two electrons max. The p orbital can hold six electrons max. The d orbital can hold 10, and the f orbital can hold 14. That means that the second shell, I'm sorry, the fourth shell, which happens to be here, the fourth shell can hold a total of 22 electrons. because it has the shells and the subshells to hold them all. If I did my math correctly, that comes up to 22 and I'm looking at it and I did. All right, so here's the synapsis. Each shell has a set of subshells. The subshells are comprised of orbitals. Each orbital can hold up to two electrons. And I know right now in your mind, because in my mind, it's coming out of jumbled mess. So in your mind, it's thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to remember all this? Well, you don't have to remember it. All right. At this point, I'm going to ask you to accept it for the time being. Well, for the time being. And we're going to explain it, how to use it here, coming up soon. In fact, we are at 1238. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the alpha process, which is the final piece. The alpha process will tell us how to fill the shells and the subshells, how to fill them. So let's take a little break. When we come back, we'll start filling out electronic configurations, and then we'll see how that relates to the periodic charge. Any questions? No. Nope. All right. I will see you back here in about 10. And, and we are recording now. So now we understand the gross and the fine structure of atoms. Now we understand the shells. We understand how the shells are divided into subshells. We understand how the subshells contain a certain set of orbitals. And we understand the order, I'm sorry, the shape of those orbitals. And it's all, it's, it's like a dance. It's a beautiful, beautiful dance. Um, but now we have to figure out the order to fill the shells and the subshells. Okay, it's a very basic rule. There's one basic rule. You always fill it from the lowest energy to the highest energy until all of your electrons have been placed. That's all there is to it, simple. And the first shell is always lower energy than the second shell, is always lower energy than the third shell, and so forth. And the s orbital is always lower energy than the p orbital. It's always lower energy than the d and then the f. All that's pretty simple and straightforward. The order we've covered it is from lowest to highest energy. But here's the problem. 
when you combine the shell and the subshell, sometimes that order gets messed up. For example, the 4S subshell actually has lower energy than the 3D subshell. It's backwards from what you expect, but we still need to fill it from lowest energy to highest energy. So how do we know the order of filling for these shells and subshells together? This is what the alfbal process is all about. It sounds like a polite dog. Alf! Alfbal. It, it's, it, it's like a joke. <laughs> Smaller. Anyway, here's how you figure it out. And you have to be really careful when you do this. Be as neat as you possibly can. For each shell, write down the subshell that it has. The first shell only has the S subshell. Below that, we're going to write the second shell. Remember, every shell has the S subshell. But it also has the P subshell. We're going to make a little kind of triangle here, right triangle. So the third shell has S, P, D. The fourth shell, S, P, D. Again, it goes up by one every single time. The fifth shell has S, P, D, F. And remember, after F, it just becomes alphabetical. You're going to find we don't need those. That's why they have not been numbered, uh, lettered. And you'll see why in a moment. So some people will actually stop here since we're not going to need those higher subshells. Some people will stop. I kind of like I kind of like the uh, um, symmetry of keeping them. And we'll stop at seven. This tells us a lot about electronic configuration in and of itself. Every shell always has the exact same set of subshells before it plus one. We just add a subshell every time we go up. Now we're going to add diagonal lines. Like this. Notice they always go through the outermost one first. Here, the 3P is kind of the next one. And we're going to stop here. If you like, you can number these. You don't have to. Now, I'm going to point out to you, there are exceptions to filling. We always go from lowest energy to highest energy. This will give us sort of the gross picture of the filling. There are exceptions. Some chemistry professors insist that students memorize these exceptions. I've always felt like memorization is nonsense. In order to figure out the order of filling, Start at the first line and just read what the lines go through. So we start with 1S. We're past the first line. Let's go to the second line. Notice it goes through 2S, so that's next. We're past the second line. Go to the third line. It goes through three, uh, 2P and then 3S. Then comes 3P, 4S. And then 3D. 
Remember I told you that 4S is lower energy than 3D and notice that the outbound process tells us this. The outbound process tells us the order of filling. And if we just keep going, it'll go 4P, 5S, 4D, 5P, uh, 6S. Notice I don't have this memorized. 4F and so on. Actually, I guess I should have gone here. And we'll stop at 17. All right, that's the outbound process. It just says, here's the order of filling. That's all there is to it. Now we have to put electrons in here. It'll help a lot if you have your periodic chart open. In fact, I just opened mine. So remember the atomic number, we're talking about elements here. We're not talking about ions. Remember, the atomic number is the number of protons, and for elements, that's also equal to the number of electrons. So if we look at a hydrogen, hydrogen has one electron. We always start filling in the 1s orbital. And to denote how many electrons we have in the orbital, we put a sub superscript. 1s1 is the electronic configuration for hydrogen. One electron, we're done. For helium, we always start with the 1s, but remember the s orbitals there's one S orbital, so the S subshell can hold two electrons. The S subshell can always hold two electrons, and that's enough. So lithium then is just one S three, right? Is that right? And at two? Ah, the S orbital is only allowed a maximum of two electrons. This is what we call, some quantum mechanists will call this a forbidden state because it cannot happen. So the most we can put in the S orbital is two electrons. But notice, there are three electrons in lithium. So what the hell happens to the third electron? Once the 1s subshell is filled, we go to the next one. So after 1s, we have 2s. Right? Right? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Of course not. How many electrons after the 1s orbital, 1s subshell, how many electrons remain? We have three electrons. We place two of them. How many remain? One. Just one. Watch which finger you use when you denote the one. This is the point where my students, for some reason, forget which finger they're supposed to use. Which brings us to an interesting point. And let's talk about this. When you add up, and this is a good check, at the end, add up the superscripts, just the superscripts. Two plus one equals what? Three. So you can always check to be sure that you are on the right track just by doing this.
let's skip ahead. I'm bored. Aren't you bored? Now, nah, let's keep going. Barium. Again, 1s2, how many electrons go in the 2s orbital? Of course. 2 plus 2 equals 4. <clears throat> it's like a boron. The S subshell can only hold two electrons. So we've only placed four. Where does the fifth electron go? After 2S, it goes to 2P. 2P or not 2P. Sometimes I wonder if I don't have just a wee bit of dyslexia. Dyslexics untie. Now we have two electrons in the p orbital. What comes after p is 3s. See, look at that little dyslexic ass. Are you going to let me write 3s? Um, no. How many electrons can the p orbital hold? Two. No. Okay. Here's the hint. It goes up by four each time. So s can hold two. Okay. P six. can hold six. D can hold 10. F can hold 14. So we can put more here. I'm gonna whip through these pretty quickly here now. I'm not gonna do the entire periodic chart. We'll do two more. Notice I'm looking at the periodic chart. Do I have the periodic chart memorized? I probably could do this from memory. I don't trust my memory that much. And so forth, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. We're gonna pause, we're gonna stop here. Now, quick comment, look at boron. The valence shell is always the outermost shell. Remember, it's only the valence shell electrons that interact. They are the most important electrons. Anything before the valence shell is inner shell. So here, Oops. The valence shell is always the inner, uh, is always the outermost shell. And a real quick comment, I want you to notice that the inner shell never changes and it is identical 
to one of the noble gases. Okay, so identical to one of the noble gases. We say they're isoelectronic. They are the same electronic configuration. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Now here's something I'm going to do that, that's going to open your eyes. I'm going to ignore all of the electrons except, except for the outermost part. Okay. I'm going to ignore both the inner shell and part of the valence shell. And I'm only going to look at that outermost piece. Okay. You going to allow me to get away with that? Sure. I hope so. Now I'm going to do something that will be a lot of fun. I'm going to take a blank periodic chart and I'm going to put just that outermost part into the periodic chart. So look and notice that, that this blank periodic chart does have the atomic number and the atomic number identifies the element. So we don't need actually the element symbol. Kim, tell me, please, what is the electronic configuration for hydrogen? One. One. Point zero zero eight. S. S. Yes. How many S? One. One. What about helium? That's right, 1s2. Thanks for playing along. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Lithium was 2s1. Bar uh, uh, barium was 2s2. Boron was 2p1. 2p2. 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. Then we had 3s1. What are you starting to notice? Could you keep going from here? They're in order. Aha. So what do you suppose element number 13 is? Three. Three. Three what? P. P. And how many? One. Say that like a question. Now tell me. Don't don't ask me. <laughs> tell me. Element number 14. What's its electronic configuration? Three P2. Perfect. But you still ask. So what's the next one? Three P3. Perfect. And so on. Mm. How many S electrons, how many electrons can fit in an S orbital? Two. And look at this. Here we have two columns set aside. What do you suppose those two columns all are? That's your S orbital right there. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> the veil has been lifted. How many P electrons are there? Oh. Uh. It goes up by four each time. So we had two S. We have how many P? Up to six. And there's your P block right there. See if you can find the D block. How many D's? Sorry, it sounds like oh, a movie. Fine. I remember watching the movie, but anyway. So there's two S, six P's, add four. 10. 10 D's, where's the D block? Where do you see 10 columns? 
on the periodic chart. Right in the metal? The transition metals. These are your D orbitals. Add four more, you have 14 F orbitals. And notice that down here at the bottom, these two lanthanides and actinides are 14 columns long. And that's the inner transition ones? That's the, those are the lanthanides and actinides. Uh, the book may have called them inner transition, I don't know. Um, the periods are usually numbered. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. What's that corresponding to? What do you mean? That's the shell number. Ah. We have the shell numbers this way. Whoops, let's try a five instead of two fours. My OCD is kicking in. Don't leave one row unfinished. So now we see the periodic chart is telling us the subshells, is telling us the shell numbers, and it's telling us the actual electronic configuration. All I have to do is count over. But now here's something that's important to remember. If we go back to our notes. Notice that before filling the 3D, we filled what? The 4S. S. So we do need to remember, if we want to do this, after the 4S comes the 3D. So we drop back one shell number to begin filling. And of course, we have to remember then to jump up to the original shell number for the P's. For the F's, we're going to drop back two shell numbers. So down here. I'm going to go from 6S2 down to 4F1. According to now, Okay. Is your mind been blown? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Makes it easier. It does. Now you can actually just look at the periodic chart and figure out the electronic configuration of any element. If you just remember to drop back one shell for the D, two shells for the F. But I want you to notice, I'm going to show you a real quick shorthand. If I wanted to look at sodium, and the, elect, uh, and the electronic configuration, notice that it starts with the helium electronic configuration. We can use that to our advantage. And by convention, you only use noble gases. So for example, let's look at And do we want to do one that complex? Let's look at silver. Silver is element number, excuse me, 47, if you have trouble finding it on the periodic chart.
47. And now we can just look on the periodic chart and rattle off the electronic configuration. will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p. You really want to do that whole thing? Probably not. So I want you to notice silver is in period five. Okay. Jump up one period. What's the noble gas for period four? Krypton. So I'm going to put Krypton in brackets. That means I have an inner shell electronic configuration identical to Krypton. That's what that's telling us. Now, like I say, it's in period five. So looking at a periodic chart, and let me let me let me do this real quick. I feel like I'm kind of confusing you, and that's about it. okay. So here's silver. We're going to start going up one and all the way to the end. So we're going to start with Krypton electronic configuration. That's what I put in square brackets. Always go to the previous period's noble gas because the electronic, the internal configuration will be the same. Now, just read off the rest of the electronic configuration. The electronic configuration goes through S. So it goes to 5S2. Remember to drop back one shell when you do the D. So it goes from 5S, uh, yeah, D, to 4D. And how many electrons in 4D? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Five is two, four D nine. So you can just read off the, the, the electronic configuration from the periodic chart. But this also explains why the chemical and physical properties for families are so similar. Because even though we are filling different shells, they are all still the same. That was the wrong thing. It's still P4, all the way down, P4, 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 P4. And elements are always trying to get to a noble gas electronic configuration. That's why the halogens are always minus one, because it has to pick up one more electron to get there. And by the way, notice I'm skipping over hydrogen and helium. Since hydrogen and helium does not have a P subshell, they're very different. They are an exception. And the reason they're an exception, quantum mechanics tells us, is because they don't have a P subshell. Notice now that in order for sodium to gain an electronic configuration of a noble gas, it's easier just to lose one electron. And then it becomes isoelectronic with neon. That's why these are all plus one. They're just losing that S subshell electron, just as these all lose the S subshell electrons, two of them. You now understand the periodic chart 
far better than probably 99% of the population. For some reason, as humans, we have a habit of accepting things as they are. How many times have you looked at the periodic chart and just recognized, oh, that's just the way it is, and never asked why it has the shape it has? Now you understand. There's a much deeper understanding, a much deeper meaning to that periodic chart than just, mm -hmm. oh, just this weird block. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I've always loved this kind of stuff. Now, I have shared with Kim a lab manual that I wrote some years ago. Actually, I shared with her two lab manuals. Uh, the organic lab manual was never terribly popular. There's a university that still uses my lab manual that I have provided for free. Actually, I'm a little bit jealous because it's, it's in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, and and I, I've been tempted to tell them they can use it as long as they fly me out and put me up for a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, inside that lab manual is an experiment that basically we just performed. We didn't quite complete it, but we basically just performed it. Uh, if you would like a copy of that lab manual, text me. I would be more than happy to share it with you. Uh, provided you're not willing to hold me liable for any injuries that might occur if you use any of the experiments. Kim, this would be a good time for you to go and do the entire lab. Now you know how to do it. Uh, and I think that it would really help to cement in the concepts that we have covered today. We are ready to start on real chemistry now. We have all the background and quantum theory that we need. And I hope I've blown your mind a little bit. Kim, any questions before we break for today? Comments, issues, complaints, problems? Um, no, just it's nice that it makes sense. Things fit, puzzle pieces are fitting together better. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and with a little practice, like I say, makes for an interesting dinner conversation to say, oh yeah, the electronic configuration of silver is starts with <laughs> Krypton, uh, let's say 5S24D9. <laughs> a big deal. Anyway, oh, sorry, these days, this is taboo. This is, this is more acceptable. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, I believe it should be. I don't smoke pot for any DEA agents watching. You'll waste your time if you come to my house. <laughs> I do believe that marijuana should be more acceptable than cigarettes and alcohol. It's just a little politicizing on my part. You don't have to agree. It's, it's an important thing to know because uh, in science, we don't know everything. But Kim, unless there's something else, I'm going to call it a day. No, that's, that's good. That's All a good right. day. I got a little silly here and held you over, so I apologize for that. Have a great day. Thank you.